Hi, hi. So we have uh, have some some fun geometry today. But first, of course, we're going to do the check-in. So, um, so the last time we talked about matrix equivalence, two matrices are equivalent if they uh, represent the same underlying map. Um, we, we've talked about before how we try to take, and this guy's got to take some point of view, and the point of view we're going to take is that maps are the primary objects and matrices are what we use to compute maps. That doesn't mean that we sneer at matrices or they're beneath us or any such thing, that's not right. In fact, we'll, you know, we've talked about them at some length before, but what it does mean is that uh, we take our, uh, the point of view we take is that it is fruitful to consider maps as somehow the underlying meaning of the subject, and we've seen that in a number of places. So, uh, so matrix equivalence is when two matrices un have the same sort of underlying mean. We saw the result last time that matrices are equivalent if they are the same size and have the same rank. Rank means that you do Gauss's method, you count the number of non-zero rows in the echelon form, that's the rank. So here the problem says, uh, here's five matrices and decide which of them are matrix equivalent. So I'm just going to do Gauss's method on those five. All right, so let's have a look. Let's see here. So uh, number one is a one, three, two, four, and I'm just simply doing Gauss's method. That's all. Minus two row one plus row two, and I get a one, three, zero minus two. So obviously the rank is two. If I was going to write down the uh, the block partial identity, I'd have uh, two ones and everything else is zero. So it's actually just an identity. Number two is uh, one, whoops, zero, three. That's right, two, one, three, three, two, six, three, two, six. Now I'll spare you the pain of watching me do the arithmetic. Everybody can do Gauss's method at this point. So I'll just, uh, I'll just say after, after you do Gauss's method in the standard way, you would get one, zero, three, zero, one, minus 3 and 0, 0, 3. And there's three non-zero rows, so we're looking at a rank 3. Uh, for number 3, I have a variant on number 2, 1, 0, 3, 2, 1, 3. Instead of 3, 2, 6, I said 3, 1, 6. Now Gauss's method gives you uh, 1, 0, 3. 0, 1, minus 3, and 0, 0, 0. So that here the rank is 2. If you were to do the block partial identity here, you'd see two ones. Everybody else, zeros. Okay. So, uh, so let's see, uh, 4. 4, 2, 2, 1. Gauss's method gives you 4, 2, 0, 0. So the rank there is 1. And then finally 5, 3, 3, 1, 2. Gauss's method gives you 3, 3, 0, 1. So the rank is 2. So what we're seeing, for example, is that matrix 1 and matrix 5 are both 2 by 2 matrices of rank 2, so they're equivalent. Notice that matrix 3 is also of rank 2, but it's not 2 by 2, so it's not equivalent. The picture that we drew, we enclosed all, uh, all matrices, And we broke the universe of all matrices up into parts. And parts are comprised of matrices with the same size and the same rank. So just as a, for instance, matrix 1 and matrix 5 belong in there. Oh, matrix 2 doesn't belong with 1 and 5, so it goes in a separate place. Matrix 3 goes in its own place down there. Matrix 4 goes in another place. If you look at this fella here, that's a rank 2, 3 by 3 matrix, so it also goes right in there somewhere. 
In fact, because that's the canonical representative, that's kind of the most obvious one, matrix that is 3 by 3 and rank 2, you might think of it as somehow as being like the capital city of that region. It's the matrix that you think of first when you think of oh, who's, in that, who's in that part of the universe. Okay, and again, this somehow represents somehow a map. This somehow rep these are, represents, represents, these are in some way, these are, are both different names for the same map. There's a BD, there's a B hat, D hat, these are different names for the same map. So uh, a thin analogy, but it's an analogy. You can imagine that, that instead of matrices, you can imagine that have strings. And in this section here are two different strings that both mean, both point to me. So you might have my name, you know, Jim Heffron, and you might have your social security number. I'm not going to tell you my social security number. And they both point to me. So I am somehow the underlying object behind all of those names. Well, these two are different names, is the point of view we're going to take. These two are different names for the same underlying map, matrix equivalent. OK, very good. All right, so, uh, so what I want to talk about today, then, the material for today is, uh, as I mentioned, is a little bit of geometry. So projection. First, I'm going to start by talking about projection onto a line, orthogonal projection onto a line. So here's the picture. I have a line right there, and uh, it's all the multiples of some vector s. So that's the span of some vector s. And there's another vector that I drew not on the line, and so I want to project that vector down onto the line. What part of the vector here, what part of the vector v, lies with s? So what I drew a picture, isn't it a terrible picture? <laughs> I have a little person who walks out on this line until the tip of v is above their head. And then they say, now I'm there, I'm there, this is the spot, put a stake down. So the picture I have is this. The person has walked out on the span of vector s. The person has walked out until they are at a place where orthogonal to cps just touches the tip of v. That is to say, v minus cps is orthogonal to cps. So I have a nice right triangle there. To figure out what CP would be, you just use the orthogonality. Do you remember that orthogonal means dot product is 0? So I have V minus CPS dotted with S. I could have used CPS, but I just use S. It doesn't matter what multiple of S I use. They're all going to be orthogonal. So V minus CPS dotted with S gives 0. That's, that's orthogonal. Dot product is 0. So you solve for CPS. You have V dot S on the top of the fraction. On the bottom of the fraction goes S dot S. So that's just a question of solving the equation. And the intuition is that I've decomposed V, this vector V, decomposed V into two parts. The part that lies with S, CPS, and the part that has no component in the direction of S at all. It's orthogonal to S. V minus CPS. Oh, I don't know why V doesn't have a little arrow over it. Oops. Anyway, V minus CPS has no part in the direction of S. So intuitively, when you look at the vector S, some part of it lies with S and some part of it does not. I broke V up, I decomposed V into two parts, and, and that's the two parts that we're looking at there on that picture. I'm just remarking here that I'm only going to work with real end spaces because they have a definition of angle for real end spaces. So I'll write that down as an equation. Here's the fraction that I just computed a minute ago. This is what I called CPS. So this is V dot S over S dot S multiplied by the vector S. So this is some multiple of the vector S, it's this particular one, is the projection onto, do you see that says span of S? So that's the line, the span of S, remember square brackets mean span. So that's the line of all multiples of S, projection of the vector V onto that line, and, and which is just the calculation we just did. And these calculations are not, not hard at all. I mean, they're, they're, right, they're big to write, but they're not hard at all. So I made up some vector, and I made up some line, all the multiples of 3, 1, 1. And I projected the vector down onto the line. I have, there's the fraction, there's the s, and here's what I get for an answer. You know, 1 3rd, 1 6, 1 6 is not a very big vector, but anyway, it's the right answer. This, this is the projection of this vector onto this line. I couldn't fit the picture on this slide, so the, the picture's on the next slide. Here's the vector v from the previous slide. 
Here's all multiples of the vector s. I got the computer to draw it for me because you've seen how I cannot draw. So uh, what you see here is the reason that the projection, see the projection in red there? The reason that the projection is so small is because v is almost perpendicular to the blue line already. So because v has almost no component in the direction of s, you get a small projection. In fact, when you take out a calculator and do the calculation, the length of v is about two and a half, but the length of the projection is only about a half. So v does not have much in the direction of s, and we saw that in, in, the, in the small, in the sort of small components of the vector. Okay, I want to I want to take that uh, take that pro orthogonal projection, and and I want to generalize it to to a bigger case. The prior, se prior subsection, the part that we just did, suggested that projecting a vector onto the line decomposes the vector into two parts. How much of V lies with the line and how much of V lies not at all with the line. How much of V lies with the line and how much of V lies not at all with the line. Because they are orthogonal, those two, they are in some sense non-interacting, and I have to give a definition for what non-interacting means, but that we, have the, we have the technology for all those things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, a set of vectors are mutually orthogonal if any two of them are, orthog are orthogonal. And an example would be the standard basis. That's a good model for orthogonal, base, for orthogonal vectors. Here's another example, a kind of less trivial example, and we've been using these two vectors here in many a basis. When I do examples, I often pick a basis consisting of these two. There they are. You can see that they are at right angles to each other. If I want to make non-interacting precise, this, this theorem does it perfectly. Non-interacting in a linear algebra class means linearly independent. So the theorem just says that if you have vectors in a set that are mutually orthogonal and non-zero, then they have to be linearly independent. So mutually orthogonal and non-zero implies independence. And the proof is very straightforward. You write down the linear combination of the vectors, set it equal to zero, as you always do for a linear independence calculation, and you take the dot product with vi for any of the i's. Because they're mutually orthogonal here, vi dotted with v1 gives you 0, vi dotted with v2 gives you 0, etc. And the, you end up with vi dotted with 0 gives you 0, and so the whole thing gives you 0 until you're, you're looking at, you're looking at uh, an answer of 0. So vi dotted with the linear combination gives you 0, and so, so, so you, get, you get that mutually orthogonal means linearly independent. And our interest in that is that in a k-dimensional vector space, in Rk, in a k-dimensional vector space, if the vectors in a size k set are mutually orthogonal and, and non-zero, then, th th then that sets a basis for the space. So if we have mutually orthogonal, we automatically get a basis. It, it, we're, we're doing, of course, Rk here. And the, the reason is that the previous theorem says orthogonal gives you linear independent. If you're in a k-dimensional space and you have a size, a linearly independent set of size k, you get span for free, and so it's a basis. So the definition is that an orthogonal basis for a vector space is just a basis of mutually orthogonal vectors. That orthogonal implies linear independence, so, uh, so it's especially convenient. In fact, the calculations with these bases are often very, very straightforward. So a lot of times when we have to do some calculations, we will, we will make the basis We'll be, we will be given a basis and we'll, we'll instead make it orthogonal. We're going to see how to do that in just one second. Make it orthogonal. Before I go on to do that, I'll make a comment here, is that for many authors use the word orthogonal basis to mean not just that the vectors in it are orthogonal and not zero, but also that the vectors in it all have length one. I try to maintain a distinction between the two, but, but many authors do not. So if you're on the internet and, and you know clicking around and you see somebody says orthogonal basis and, and they have gone to the trouble of making all the bases have uh, all the basis vectors have length one, that's why. They're using orthogonal to mean orthogonal and all of length one. And that, that's very common. Okay, so here's the theorem. If you're given a basis, how do you turn it into an orthogonal basis? 
This is called the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. Anyway, if you're given a basis, here's the basis, beta 1 through beta k. If you're given a basis, how do you turn it into an orthogonal basis? Okay, so, so the basic idea is pretty straightforward. The, for the first member of the new basis, you just take the first member of the basis you were given. For the second member of the new basis, you take the second member of the old basis and subtract away any part that lies with, k to, with kappa 1. So you're taking any part of beta 2 that lies with kappa 1 and subtracting it away. So the only thing left will be the part of beta 2 that does not lie with kappa 1. And of course we saw that before. The part of, where's my picture? There we go. The part of, the part of beta 2 that does not lie with kappa 1 is going to be orthogonal to the, to the span of kappa 1 is the basic idea there. For kappa 3, you take beta 3, you subtract away the part that lies with kappa 1, and then you subtract away the part that lies with kappa 2, and like that. Okay, so uh, as, as we do so often, we won't give a proof here. Instead, we're going to give an example, and then the person watches the video with the example and then comes to the proof in the book with, a, with a, you know, some intuition about how it's going to go. Here's a first, we're going to give two examples. Here's the first example in R2. So I'm given two basis vectors. It's clear that they're not orthogonal. If you take the dot product, you don't get zero. I want to get a basis, kappa 1, kappa 2, that is orthogonal. So for, for kappa 1, I just simply take beta 1. For kappa 2, you take the part of beta 2 that does not lie with kappa 1, the part of beta 2 that has no kappa 1 in it. So beta 2 minus the projection onto the span of kappa 1 of beta 2. So beta 2 minus how much of beta 2 lies with kappa 1. What's left has no part that lies with kappa 1. Minus 2 fifths, 1 fifth, and you can see when you take the dot product of those two, you get 0. So the basic idea, the simple idea, I should say, simple idea is to take the second given vector, subtract away any part of the second given vector that lies in the direction of the first given vector, and what's left has nothing in the direction of the first given vector. That is to say, it's orthogonal. Another example. I have a basis, and it, I just made up some, you've seen me make these up before. They're not too big, not too small numbers. So to start, I take kappa 1 to be the first. As in the previous example, I to take kappa 2, you take beta 2, the minus 1, 2, 1. You take beta 2 and you subtract away the part of beta 2 that lies with kappa 1. So this is the part of beta 2 that lies with kappa 1. And that's the calculation that we saw earlier, the part of beta 2 that lies with kappa 1. So the projection onto the span of kappa 1 of beta 2. And when you do the calculation, you get minus 3 halves, 3 halves, 0. And you, uh, you can check that, that when you dot product these two, you get 0. So indeed, they're, they're orthogonal. And then the next step is the only one that could confuse a person. You take beta 3, subtract away the part of beta 3 that lies with kappa 1, and also subtract away the part of beta 3 that lies with kappa 2. So say that again. Beta 3. Subtract away the part of beta 3, beta 3, that lies with kappa 1, and also subtract away the part of beta 3, beta 3, that lies with kappa 2. What's left has no part in the direction of kappa 1 and no part in the direction of kappa 2. And the, 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 the uh, kappa 1 and kappa 2 are on the prior slide. Well, they're actually here and here. But you can check that if you take the dot product of this with those two, you'll get 0. Now, a person, a person might say to themselves, well, wait, you're doing all this subtracting. Is it not possible you take away everything? Is it not possible you end up with 0, 0, 0 here, and that can't be a part of a basis? That's, that's the thing that the proof has to check. The proof has to check that when you take beta 3 and subtract away these things, you can't end up with 0. Uh, just a comment about the intuition there. Beta 3 can't consist only of a part in the direction of kappa 1 and a part in the direction of kappa 2 because if it consisted only of somehow parts from kappa 1 and kappa 2 then you wouldn't have a basis to start with. Beta 3 has to have some part all its own, some part that's brand new. A anyway, the proof goes through and shows that you can't end up with a zero there. 
So here's a picture. This is a nice geometry. So I got the computer to draw a picture for me because I can't draw these pictures. Here's the original basis I started with. For example, beta 1 is 1, 1, 2. So x equals 1, y equals 1, z equals 2. And the angles there are not right angles. They're just not. I mean, you know, if you take 1, 1, 2 and you dot product it with 0, 3, minus 1, you don't get 0. You just don't. But when I change to kappa 1, kappa 2, kappa 3, beta 1 is the same. But kappa, but kappa 2 and kappa 3 are, are new vectors, derived from the old, of course, but new vectors. And you can see that what's happened here is that these three vectors are mutually orthogonal. Computer can draw it much better than I can. Those three red vectors are mutually orthogonal. And for some calculations that a person does, having mutually orthogonal makes the calculations much, much easier. So that's a thing commonly done in practice, is to change a given basis to one where the, where the basis vectors are mutually orthogonal. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, what's often done in practice is you go on to make the, the basis vectors not only mutually orthogonal, but also of length 1. You would take, for example, 1, 1, 2, and divide it by the length of 1, 1, 2 to get a vector of length 1. And you do that for all three. So that's to say we could go on to make this basis even more like the standard basis by normalizing all the members to have length 1. And you could call that an orthonormal basis. So the red, you take the red and you make all those vectors have length 1, you'd call that an orthonormal basis. I've mentioned before that many authors will, in fact, sort of always do that without saying it. They won't call it an orthonormal basis, they'll just call it an orthogonal basis, and they, they won't worry about the fact that, uh, that, that, they, that they haven't counted the normality. They'll just, they'll just call that. So orthogonal basis often means orthonormal basis in practice. Okay, very good. So that ends chapter three, so very exciting. The course breaks really into three parts. Chapter one and two is the first third. Chapter three is the middle third. And then chapter four and five is the, is the third third. So, uh, so, so great, we're going to start in on chapter four. So we're going to start in on the third third of the course. Very good. We'll see you then.